The History of Poland, Episode 16, The End of Władysław's Dismal Reign. Hello again, and welcome back. I, unfortunately, have a mistake that I need to rectify. You see, for a long time now, we've had some people named Bolesław. Right now, we're on Bolesław III. Only, as one of our listeners pointed out to me via email, thank you, Jake, it's not pronounced Bolesław, it's pronounced Bolesław. So, that was a recurring mistake. It will take a little bit, probably, for me to adjust to that, just because it's so ingrained in my brain right now, but hopefully that won't happen again. Anyway. Last time, we left off with Zbigniew and Bolesław getting ready to face off against Siachech and their father, Władysław. While the brothers had managed to convince their father to give them political authority and to split the state with them, they had overlooked the fact that Siachech was still in his position as Count Palatine. This was an oversight they likely came to regret. Picking up with Siachech, we'll hear from Gallus as he gives us a very detailed account of the struggle, very likely given to him by multiple first-hand participants in the clash. Quote, for, as they tell, Siachech in the meantime was weaving plots against the boys and using all manner of wiles to turn the father's feelings from love of his sons. He even installed his comites or bailiffs, either from his own clan or an inferior, to take control of the castles in the boys' assigned areas. And by skillful cunning, he encouraged them not to pay heed to the boys. His hostile plots were in fact directed against both brothers, but most he feared Balasuav. He was the legitimate heir, and a strong personality, and should he become king after his father Siachech knew it would be to his misfortune. The brothers, however, had bound themselves together by oath. They agreed upon a sign, so that if Siachech attempted to plot against either of them, the other would come to his aid with all his forces and suffer no delay or truce. Now it happened, whether as a trick or because of how things really stood, I do not know, that Duke Władysław sent word to the boy Bolesław that he had heard from spies that the Czechs were about to invade Poland in search of plunder. He should therefore hasten with all speed to a specified location and call to his aid the comites of his duchy, appointees of Siachech in whom the boy had not the least confidence. The boy, however, in good faith obeyed his father's orders and hastened to the designated place with his companions. End quote. From here, it appears that Bolesław's guardian, Wojsław, as he was still pretty young at this point, declined to go face the supposed Czechs who were planning on invading. Gallus tells us that some of Bolesław's supporters told him, quote, You have reason to fear danger. Your father has ordered you to proceed to a lonely place and to summon Siachech's friends and henchmen there to your aid. But these people have designs on your life. We know, we are certain, that Siachech will stop at nothing to eliminate your whole family and you in particular, as the heir to the kingdom, and to seize the whole of Poland and keep it in his hands alone. What is more, comes Wojsław, in whose charge we are entrusted, is related to Siachech and would undoubtedly have come with us had he not discovered that there was some intrigue afoot against us. So now we must come up very quickly with some idea so we can get around the danger which threatens us. These words struck very deep fear into young Bolesław. Tears flowed and his body ran with sweat. A plan was agreed on, one which for young minds was quite well conceived, and they sent to Zbigniew the agreed signal that he and his men should come to their aid as soon as possible, and they themselves hurried back equally fast to the city of Vrokvav, where the plotters could seize control of it. So, young Balasuov returned, and on arrival called a meeting, first of the leading townsmen and elders, and then of the people as a whole. In tears, as a boy would be, he told them point by point of the plot that Siachech had set for him. They in turn wept out of affection for the boy. Angry and indignant, they cried out against Siachech, reviling him in his absence. Then Zbigniew arrived in haste with a small band of followers, not having had time to gather more. Being older and versed in letters, he was able to add rhetorical color to his brother's speech, and now that the people were in uproar, his fine oration roused them further to protest their loyalty to his brother and opposition to Siachech. These were his words. That is, Zbigniew's words. Citizens, your constant and unbroken loyalty has been known and proved to our forefathers and to us as well, young as we are. If it were not so, we would never have placed in you all our hope for protection and counsel at this hour. Young and weak, we have been the victims of terrible events and find ourselves hard-pressed by enemies on all sides. But our own people, and foreigners alike, know full well how much you have suffered for the plots that are directed against our lives by persons whose aim it is to utterly abolish the succession of our kindred and by turning order upside down to distort the inheritance of natural lords. 
Our father is old and infirm, and is less able to see to his own needs than ours or to the needs of our country. Thus, with no one but ourselves to protect us, we have no choice. Either we fall by the sword, or the wicked deeds of upstarts, or we flee beyond the borders of Poland into exile. So we beg you, open your hearts to us, tell us your feelings. May we stay, or must we leave our country? At these words, the whole multitude of the people of Rokhov were touched to the heart with grief. For a brief moment they were dumbstruck, then at once they burst into speech and with one accord revealed the thoughts that rose in their minds along with their feelings of loyalty. We indeed intend to keep our faith to our natural Lord, they declared. To your father well he lives, nor will we fail his children as long as we draw breath. So have no lack of faith in us. Gather a force, take arms, hasten to your father's court, and there, with all due respect for your father, get satisfaction for the injury you have suffered. The townsmen were still speaking and protesting their loyalties on oath when comes Voiswav, who was bringing up the boy Balaswav, arrived from his service and was unaware of what was going on. But as he was related to Siachech, he was suspected of treachery and kept from entering the city and attending to the boy's needs. He insisted he could set their minds at rest and that if there had been a falling out, he had been unaware of it. He kept following them and asking for pardon, but at that point the boys would not have anything to do with him, but gathered troops and set out to confront their father. End quote. At this meeting, during which Boleslav and Zbigniew managed to win over a great deal of public support against Yachech, one other interesting event happens that Gallus tells us about. A man named Skarbomir, a relatively influential noble, managed to replace Voiswav as Boleslav's guardian, and it was apparently under his influence that the entire populace had gathered together to push against Yachech. I tell you this because Skarbomir is going to play a role in coming episodes when Boleslav is a little bit further along in his career. Anyway, Gallus goes on to tell us that after this meeting, quote, their armies met at a place called Zarnovich, Duke Władysław and his sons camping separately. Protracted wrangling through envoys from both sides followed, but in the end, with the counsel of the magnates and the threats of the young men, the boys managed to force the old man to dismiss Sitchech. They say the father even took an oath never again to recall him to his former position of honor, end quote. Well, it appears that Siachech is now in the outs. But of course, he's been building up his own loyal retainers the entire time, has founded his own town, still has fortresses personally loyal to him. With this in mind, Siachech fled to Siachechov, which unsurprisingly is the town that he founded since he named it after himself, and locked himself in the fortress there for protection. It's a bit poetic justice, as this was the very same prison that Vladislav had locked up Zbigniew after his first rebellion. In response to this, both Boleslav and Zbigniew went to their father and asked for his help. The father consented, and they gathered an army to pursue Siachech. Gallus tells us what happened next. Quote, As they were pursuing him and doing their best to drive him from the land, Vladislav himself slipped out of the camp at night when he was believed to be sleeping in his bed, and without the knowledge of his entourage, boarded a small boat with only three close retainers and crossed to Siachech on the other side of the Vistula. At this, the magnates were outraged. It was not the action of a wise person, they said. It was the decision of a madman to forsake his sons and all the nobles as well as the army. They called a council on the spot and decreed that Boleslav was to seize Sandomierz and Krakow and the nearest main seats of the kingdom, extract assurances of their loyalty, and rule them as lord, while Zbigniew was to hasten against Mazovia and secure Płock and the adjoining region. Boleslav did in fact seize and hold the aforesaid cities, but Zbigniew failed in his mission as his father got there first. End quote. The struggle continued for a bit longer, until finally the two sides gathered in one place. While an armed showdown was likely, it was due to the work of the Archbishop of Gniezno, a colleague of Gallus's, that peace was finally brokered. Gallus tells us that, quote, There the loyal old man, Archbishop Martin, with great pains and tact, diffused the anger and discord between the father and the sons. This time, too, they say, Duke Władysław affirmed on oath that he would never more retain Siachech. Then Boleslav restored to his father the cities he had occupied, but the father did not observe the agreement made with the sons. Finally, the boys pressured the old man to the point that they fulfilled their wishes of expelling Siachech from Poland. But how this came about, and how he returned from exile, would be long and tiresome to explain. Suffice it to say that thereafter he was no longer allowed to exercise any authority. End quote. This is as good a place as any to end the tale of Sietchech, who seemed to have survived the war he had caused. But strangely, he was never heard from again, and there aren't really good records about what happened to him after this. 
But what of the stability of the Polish state, you ask? What of Władysław's relationship with his sons? Well, the events I just described happened in the year 1101, and Władysław died in 1102. So, there wasn't much time for reconciliation. Or, apparently, for Władysław to explain why he took the side of Siacic against his own sons. But we do have a record of Władysław's final days, courtesy once again of Gallus. He tells us that, quote, the Duke, mindful of the earlier uprising, since he had banished Siacic from Poland, would not appoint a palatine or vice palatine to his court, even though he was now weak with age and ill health. Instead, he made wise provision for everything personally or by his counsel, or gave over the care and responsibility for his court to some Comes whose province he was visiting. Thus he ruled his country alone without any Count Palatine, until his spirit was set free from the burden of his body, and passed on to its deserved dwelling place there to abide for eternity. So Duke Władysław died in the fullness of age and after a long illness, and for five days Archbishop Martin with the chaplain celebrated the funeral rites in the city of Płock, not daring to bury him because he was waiting for the sons. When they came, before their father was even in the grave, a bitter quarrel nearly broke out between the two brothers about the division of the treasury and the kingdom. But by grace of God and the faithful old archbishop's mediation, they kept the instructions their father had given in life while he lay dead before them. So Duke Władysław was laid to rest with great pomp and honor in the church of Płock, and the king's treasury was divided between his sons, and each received his portion of the kingdom of Poland that their father had assigned them while alive. End quote. So, we say goodbye to Władysław, a most flawed ruler who deserved far worse than he got and was treated far better than he had earned. We're going to stop here for now, but before we do, I wanted to just add one other thing about Władysław's reign. While it doesn't have a huge influence immediately, its influence will be felt down the line. This is that the First Crusade was launched in 1095, right in the middle of Władysław's reign. That's a monumental event in and of itself that will eventually spur some crusades in the Baltic region that Poland will instigate and participate in, but that's not why it matters for Władysław. One of the things that the crusade sparked was something called the People's Crusade, which, as one of its results, ended up with a ton of Jewish people in the Rhineland area of the empire being forced from their homes. Where did they go? Well, a good number of them ended up in Poland, where they were apparently well received by the PS dynasty. This is commonly seen as the beginning of a long intertwining of European Judaism and Poland. We'll obviously revisit this again in the future, but I just wanted to mention it here so it was on the record. As an aside, if you're interested in learning more about the Crusades than it could ever fit into this podcast, I highly, highly recommend the History of the Crusades podcast. This isn't some advertisement, this is me just honestly recommending it. It's one of the shows that inspired me to start this podcast in the first place. You can find it wherever you're listening to this podcast. And with that, that's the end of this episode. I'll see you next time as we get right into the thick of it. It should come as no surprise that Boleslav and Zbigniew are not going to just happily share power. As always, if you're interested in supporting the show, even a dollar two is very highly appreciated. You can help out on Patreon at patreon.com slash history of Poland podcast. Or if you're interested in giving three dollars, you'll be able to get our forthcoming series on the origins of the Holy Roman Empire, which, if you're curious, will be coming soon. Thanks. See you next time.